Evan, welcome back, round two. Dude, so stoked to be here. Yes. I love this house. <clears throat> I love your setup. It's a great space. Blessed. Yeah, man. 100% blessed. Aren't we all? Absolutely. And then that's the whole thing is to recognize oneself as the sun cut through the clouds always already the sun yet it's up to us to recognize it yeah and when basic needs aren't met it's harder to recognize the sun because of fighting for survival and safety and water and food Evan and I in the first episode covered a lot of his trajectory in football and cannabis and consciousness so in the second episode we're just gonna dive right into the essence of the indescribable perfection that this all is bringing God back to the West synthesizing science and spirituality the natural state Versus the altered state of consciousness. We can give a little bit of context there that the altered state being the state of separation, the state of ego. Mm. And then the natural state being the state of oneness, being the state of infinity, being the state of nothingness, being the state of perfection. Mm. So, Eb... I would really like for you to share since December, since our first episode, what have been these pivotal, pivotal cutting through the clouds to recognize the sun for you? And what insights has that yielded? Mm. what what does a miracle look like like what does a miracle look like we are constantly in the west in particular which is why i brought that up to you in our text yesterday bringing the west back to god and at first i was going to say how do we bring god back to the west but god is already here he's been here <laughs> <laughs> you know and it seems as though the west has done its damnedest at extricating itself from oneness the universe the universal reality of God of truth. And we're really looking for something to be that miracle, that experience. That's why psychedelics are so powerful and have emerged the way they have in the last few years and especially. Because they give us that explosion into the oneness, into that natural state of consciousness. And I love what you said. Because at first, someone might say, altered, altered states of consciousness versus the natural state of consciousness. Oh, the altered state is when you're on psychedelics or on some sort of <laughs> drug, drug-induced trip. And the natural state, that's, that's me. That's where I am. You know, and I love how you redefined it and flipped it on its head. Um, and we are so desperate for answers. We are so desperate to concretize our environment, our reality. And say, this is this, and this is this, and this is how it is. 
never once stopping to be with what actually is. And I don't know how to describe the difference between who I was seven months ago or eight months ago when I was here last, the person sitting here today. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, back then, I would have said, I'm a different person than I was six months ago. ago. Yeah. Um, and it really comes down to this constant surrendering to what is. Letting go of the thoughts, letting go of the thinking, letting go of the figuring out, letting go of the trying and just feeling what is. It speaks volumes over the thought <laughs> chatter that comes, you know. <laughs> it just speaks volumes. And I posted this thing the other day. Buddha said, when I speak, I compromise myself. Love that post. And... It's so true. You know, we were talking earlier before when I got here, the gateless gate, the <laughs> veilless veil, the veilless veil, <laughs> the chainless, the chains. chainless chains. So good, so good. And then I was thinking as we sat down, the podcastless podcast. How do you do a podcast without words? <laughs> Just let the silence, the energy reverberate through the microphones, and let that. Bless the ears of whoever's brave enough to listen. But it's because words are so limited. And words, our mind, our minds use words to create. They come into our minds. We hear the sounds come into our minds and they're symbols. And our minds use these words to create a construct, a model of understanding so that we can then process the information that's coming in and receive it and make an idea or create a concept around what it is that's being spoken about. All the while losing perhaps complete touch with the energetic meaning that was intended from the speaker or whatever it might be. All the while, throughout society, we've really gotten ourselves into this place where we are so righteously trying to do good and trying to do the right thing and trying to make everyone comfortable and meanwhile, it's creating more division. It's creating more separation, more isolation. And that's really what Buddha was talking about. You know, he could have the golden nugget of wisdom, the golden ticket of the thing that he could give to his students and say, listen to this, read these words, hear what, hear what I have to say to you. And they could still receive it in any fucking way that was possible that could totally be contradictory or tangential or whatever it might be in terms of what he was actually trying to impart on his students. And so it's difficult to describe. Yeah. Yeah. This coming to oneness. Yeah. Yep. Or this coming to the realization of there's nothing to figure out. There's nothing to understand. Yeah. And this isn't, this isn't some kind of, you know, I wrote this whole piece about it. I wrote this whole piece about it. Why in the West, we're so fascinated by the Eastern mystics and the gurus. And, <clears throat> Audiences sit completely spellbound. Someone like Sadhguru or Osho or Ramdas or whoever it might be. 
Audiences sit spellbound, American people, spellbound. Vivekananda came in the 1890s to America to bring yogic philosophy to this country. Because his master, his, his teacher, Saint uh, um, Ramakrishna, told him, Vivekananda, this is your work. You have to go and impart this wisdom, these teachings onto the world. So he went to America. And it was fascinating to me because I just did a podcast about this, that yoga came to America first in its psychology, in its spirit. It didn't come as the physical yeah. art form that we know it, know it as today, which has become predominant. And I think there's great value in the physical art form of it. Totally. Absolutely. In the asana practice of yoga. But he came and he blew people's minds talking about oneness, talking about the greater good, the truth of who we all are as beings underneath all of this stuff. Yes. And it occurred to me that, <laughs> you know, audiences, <laughs> American audiences or Western audiences, we sit spellbound in the midst of these gurus. Because with such clarity and such depth and such non-attachment is really the key. Yeah. Yeah. They are non-attached. Not fixated. And they can muse on the mechanisms of the human mind and the human experience. Yes. And so audiences sit transfixed in the in the environment in the atmosphere of this non-attached being. Yeah. And all of us have, if you've ever had the chance to sit with someone like that, you have that experience of being immersed in their bliss, in their state of consciousness. Yeah. Only to five minutes after you walk out of the place, Be back you're in. sucked right back into your dualistic yeah. <laughs> your paradigm. Yeah. Of me and I and you are you and that's them and I have my beliefs and wow, how about that guy? He really knew some things, didn't he? And the guru goes back to doing his thing, laughing the whole way, understanding this. Because he realizes, he knows that every single person, every individual in that audience has the capability to experience or live in that state of awareness yeah but is simply trapped in this way of thinking or way of believing things are yeah. as a result of being attached and being fixated on the things and so There are, I don't know if this makes sense. Is it making sense? Yeah. <clears throat> it seems like <clears throat> we're diving into the indescribable perfection also from a mysticism and a Western, which is very insightful and helpful and also the core essence of the Buddhist and generally Eastern teachings. And I would like to also tie in a thread here that it will be important to weave, which is what exactly is the mystic or the yogi um, bringing with them? Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned this several times, this non-attachment, this non-fixation, this density of consciousness, light, love that is in union with oneness, in union with nothing and infinity, hmm. in union with serving the field uh -huh. in a way that is not attached, but hyper compassionate because it sees the field as itself. Hmm. And so the, the core 
suchness, the core union that the mystic or the yogi is in, is both what we already are, and yet it is also a a cessation of the fluctuations of mind that enable us to actually feel the essence of the one heart that underlies everything Mm. and that has always underlied everything and that will always underlie everything. And so the, the tying thread, it really just, it really does feel like the, the self inquiry question of who am I or what is this? I Mm. me, my is this first link in this dependent origination is am I attached to this appearance of a costume in the game of life? Mm. Um, Or am I aware that what underlies the costume is that essence of Sat Chit Ananda existence, consciousness, bliss, that oneness and that unity, because as soon as you venture into mind and separation and likes and dislikes and indifferences and samsara, mm. that is directly related to your attachment to identity. So it's it's yes. really, yeah, the link goes from oneness, from absolute equanimity, absolute suchness, to the first is the distortion of identity is the first link with ignorance. And then it's with that I, me, my, and attachment to costume is likes, dislikes, and differences in samsara. Mm. And so it really is that cutting through clouds to an abiding, awakening presence. So that's a little knit through what we're I love that. About. I love that, dude. Cool. So good. Um, so good. <laughs> no, it's awesome. And in that, coming back to what does a miracle look like? Yeah. What, what is that thing that you're constantly seeking that you think is going to bring you the answer? You know, <laughs> that so many people are trapped in. And when you get on the this fast track of evolution of your consciousness where you really start to experience these things that presents traps in itself because then you're looking for that God experience once again as the thing that's going to show you that you're on the path still or whatever it is, you know? (laughs) And, uh, for me, it's been a, a big part of my process has been a letting go of that. Yeah. A letting go of the, the seeking out of the bliss, the seeking out of the oneness, the seeking out of the, whatever it is that I think is the thing that denotes that I'm on the spiritual path. Because what's what about all that stuff in between there? From one miracle to the next, what about all of that? It's not like God stopped happening or that the universe stopped happening. What about when I'm not feeling so intensely connected and so intensely inspired and creative? What about that? Because that shit, that's real too. That's fucking there. That's all of it happening too. Yes. The ebbs and the flows. Yes. Ram Dass, one of my favorite, he's one of my, you know, I listen to these guys all the time because it keeps me, it keeps my eye on the ball listening to guys like Ram Dass or Osho. In particular, Alan Watts. Because the way they speak about the reality or the universal reality or the nature of reality 
I find it brings me back to shedding the spiritual materialistic bullshit. Yeah. But Ramnas talks about something that was so profound to me. And I think many in the West who are venturing onto this path, whether it's through meditation or yoga or whatever, or psychedelics even. And you, <clears throat> he said when he first started meditating, he was working with this guy, Joseph Goldstein. He's a master meditation teacher. <laughs> and he, he's working with Joseph and he's at this like, you know, week long meditation retreat. And he's in there meditating. And he said he was just experiencing such bliss and such peace. And just, it was so rich. And his life was just expanding beyond anything he could have ever imagined. And he said he got up from the meditation and he walked over to Joseph. And he said, Joseph, I just, I can't thank you enough, man. I can't thank you enough. I've never felt so blissful and beautiful and at peace in my entire life and joseph said that's great man just go back sit down and keep listening to your breath <laughs> you know <laughs> and he realized he was like oh shit because then of course inevitably throughout that week-long meditation retreat he was going to experience mind-boggling boredom yeah. mind-boggling you know discontent impatience all of these things frustration and he said the realization he had was that anytime i'm caught in the seeking of the peace or the bliss or the richness i'm still i'm attached i'm hooked in this dualistic paradigm yes. because with the peace there's chaos that's the flip side to the coin with the bliss or the, the pleasure, there's pain on the other side of that. There's suffering on the other side of that. And so to take that to the next level, he talks about the saints in India. And in India, they call these people the living dead. Because these guys are living in that space of nothingness. And they don't teach. They barely speak. They just be. Their life is their teaching. Yeah in this place and he says that they're bearing the unbearable which is this sensation or this place of existence where you're you're living in the place of complete non-attachment to anything you're completely detached from the experiential ebbs and flows yes now that doesn't really do us a whole lot of good if we're trying to have a podcast, yeah. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> if we're playing the role of the husband, the father, the teacher. Yeah. So what do we do with that? What can we do with that in the West and bringing the West back to God, which is why I love what you do so much, dude, because you, you are coming at this thing from a place that is highly relatable to a consciousness or a model of consciousness that is perhaps unwilling to go to these places yeah because it really is as simple as the deconstructing of the self yes it's that simple it is there's no yep you know the students come to the zen master and the zen masters give them or any spiritual guru they give them these koans yeah these unanswerable questions or there's another great story. I can't remember who it is, but one of the great spiritual mystics. He found his teacher, either in India or China or whatever it was, Japan. And the teacher said, okay, I need you to go over there and build, build a house. 
And the student went, okay. And went and built the house. Went and got the went and got his master. And he said, look, man, I built the house. The teacher goes, tear it down. Tear it all down. Yeah, it's just insane. It's just intense. Yeah. <clears throat> and he's like, uh, okay. <laughs> so he goes and he tears it all down. He goes back, gets his master, brings him. He's like, look, man, I, I tore down the house. He's like, build it up again. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, okay <laughs> he goes and he builds it up again goes and gets his master look I did it I built it up again master goes fucking tear it down and it was it was just the complete deconstruction of this guy's psychological prism of thinking that spirituality was going to come through any vessel vehicle teaching fucking magic pill whatever it is enlightenment was not that because we have to get out of our way we have to get out of the fucking way because it's all there it's all happening right there right now right here you know do you do you feel like it would be valuable for us to explore the process of deconstructing ourselves yes I love that because if we're aiming to synthesize spirituality into science and entrepreneurship and um, the individualism of the West, that one of the core ways to do it is to have the West in its obsession with form and name and differentiation to go through a process of um, deconstructing the very nature of their identity itself just go direct to the source or to the heart Mm. so when normally i like asking uh, the question what is looking and for those that are really sincere because if there's a high level of sincerity there'll be a high level of humility and a high level of earnest Uh inquiry rather than this conditioned response. And so the suggestion might be something like, might it be God or nothing or infinity, oneness, perfection itself, eternity, looking at itself. Might this be eternity talking to itself, Hmm. using the costumes of Eben and Atlas to talk to itself in an exploration called life universe. And so the simple shift in deconstructing identity is from the separate self to recognizing oneself as the very source of it all playing with itself and therefore the only expression that emerges from that state of compassion is service Mm. honorable loving compassionate Mm. service so what kind of a process are you using with the deconstructing of self and were there resonances there you know for me it all begins with the breath beautiful because the breath is the is is the tool we have access to to in which we are able to tap into our nervous system and to switch from the low vibrational frequency of our reptilian brain fight flight freeze which many of us are walking around in a low hum state of that awareness constantly which is a direct result of constant mouth breathing 
and very high chest and neck breathing. And it switches us when we activate through nasal breathing. We activate our parasympathetic nervous state, which is our rest, digest, recover nervous state. But it's also it activates our prefrontal cortex, the Godhead. So human beings, we're so, we are such a miracle manifestation of the universe because we are animal and God combined. We have the animal instincts, this animal body that can hunt and run and jump and do all these things necessary for survival. But we have been gifted with God consciousness, this infinite, eternal consciousness, memory, imagination. So with that, now we've also, through the prism of our, what can we call that? Our, the matrix of our being, being birthed into this physical realm, into the body that we're given, or that we chose, depending on your perception yeah. or your understanding or your belief system. With family, friends, an ecosystem of people around us, other organisms, other divinely constructed organisms, that then go to create this psychological spiritual prism of awareness, understanding, traumas, experiences, that then when we become adults, everything is functioning through or coming through this prism. Yeah. Is that making sense? Yeah, as though there's this, <clears throat> the awareness itself um, is like the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Uh -huh. And then all of the family, friends, concepts, ideas, name, career, yep. form, separation, all of those things are the star systems and planets that are orbiting around this black hole. And we're wondering what happens when you turn the what happens when you turn awareness on itself? What happens mm. when you investigate the very black hole, the very yes. awareness love light? Yes. All of that, that's not really uh, uh, that I'm, I'm giving all of this as context to where we're going to how you get into unraveling yourself. So the breath helps us tap in, helps us clear the mind. It helps us let go of at least momentarily without having done the significant work whether that's through psychotherapy or psychedelics or various healing modalities, etc., body work, yoga. You can momentarily let go of the clutter and the things that are sort of lingering in your psychic ether. So then, take a deep breath into the solar plexus. In through the nose. Use your diaphragm to pull that air in. You can just let it all out. Let it out the mouth. Let that exhale take with it all the tension in your body. Take another breath in the nose. Into the solar plexus. Yeah, just let it all out. Let it all out. And immediately you feel this sense of relief. You feel a sense of betterness. And so when you practice this and you cultivate this practice throughout your life, and this is all day, every day, this is coming into awareness of your being, 
Now, when things start to come up, anger, frustration, sadness, grief, old memories emerge. That's why the asana practice of yoga to me is so powerful. Because this body, this physical vessel, things get stored in it. Traumas, experiences, they get stored in all these places in our body. So there are four planes of existence. Spiritual plane, emotional plane, mental plane, physical plane. And these correlate to the four elements. Spiritual to fire, emotional to water, mental to air, physical to earth. Now, when you begin to use these, and all these planes function independently, but also interdependently with one another. The universe is all built on the emotional body. Our emotional body is what the universe responds to. So when you're talking about manifestation, this is about emotional body level beliefs. You could also rename the emotional body as the subconscious. So your subconscious or your emotional body functions on a level of belief based on past premises through past experiences so now your perception of your current reality is a projection of your emotional body belief about who you are what you are the world around you what's safe what's not your level of success what's possible what's impossible so now, the beauty of this is that our subconscious mind or our emotional body is amenable. It's suggestible. We can reprogram it. We can redefine the belief system of what we believe is possible and our perception of our reality. How do you do that? You do that through the physical plane. You do that through the earthly plane. You do that by getting into action. You do that by little by little, step by step, taking actions which show your emotional body, programming it with new input, with new beliefs about what is possible and how that possibility comes into fruition. So, for instance, an old programming thing might be anger comes up. That anger gets expressed in a number of ways in a fight in an argument in a verbal altercation maybe if you've done some work you express it through exercise or through artwork or through some other expression some other form of, form of work but now once you've retrained that even and you've developed this sense of non-attachment to it through the breath. The breath and meditation are the keys, in my opinion, or in my experience, of developing non-attachment. Developing or releasing yourself from the attachment to these things that we cling to as being ours or mine. What Buddha called anapanasati. Mm. Yeah. Love that. Yep. So we have this deep use of this tool that is forever with us of the inhalation and exhalation very deep mindfulness which then gives us the right view of yes. the nature of reality perpetually yes i had a head coach in the nfl coaches had a lot of great things to say i don't know if they believed them all or you put them into use but <laughs> One of the best things, Mark Tressman, head coach of the Chicago Bears while I was there. He said, guys, if you ever find yourself in a situation or a place where you think you might not be, sh maybe you shouldn't be here. Maybe it's not a good thing that you're here. Take three deep breaths and then make a decision. I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, dude. Yeah. And um, so... So now you get to this place where, okay, anger comes up. Oh, that's not mine. Yeah. Let's look under the blanket. Yeah. 
of anger. Who's under there? Who's under there? Oh, that's the little kid. Oh, that's the teenager who is always insecure. Who thought he was never good enough. Oh, that's the little kid who was scared because he was growing up in a chaotic household. Ah. I see you. Insight. I love you. Yes. I'm with you. We're safe now. Yes. Perfect. I'm currently reading this book, Letting Go, David Hawkins, Pathway of Surrender. And he talks about how our emotions, and see, this is what's so powerful about emotions. Emotions are the amalgamation of thousands of thoughts and experiences that we've had throughout our lifetime. And they culminate in these emotions. Now, in the West, we're really fucking bad at allowing our emotions. We believe that it's not okay to feel things. Somehow, I don't really understand how that became so ingrained in our belief system. Some woke uh, ideologue might say that it has something to do with toxic masculinity or some nonsense like that, but I just don't, I don't see any connection to that. Although men in particular are in a spiritual crisis because of this old paradigm of what true masculinity is supposed to be or what it's supposed to look like, but that's another conversation. But overarching in the West, we have such a difficult time allowing our emotions. So what do we do? We suppress them. We repress them. We express them unconsciously. We escape We go into our phone, we go to the porno, we go to the thing, we go to the video game, whatever it might be. We do whatever we can to shift our perception out of the feeling. The the issue is those feelings, they don't just go away. They get suppressed and they get buried and they build up a karmic weight around them. Mm. an energetic weight Mm -hmm. that gets compacted and compiled and it grows and it becomes bigger and more volatile and then at some point it has to be expressed volcanic eruptions exactly and we see this all the time see it all the time and it's a direct result of the suppressing and repressing of emotions over entire lifetimes. People are having fucking heart attacks all over the world because of this. Cancer, all of these things. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? How do we get to the place where the emotions can come up? And be beautiful and be celebrated like fireworks. Yes. And and also having equanimity. Yes. So rather than being shifted into the vicissitudes of pleasure and pain incessantly, Uh having equanimity with this radical allowing and loving. Yes. Because that, my brother, is where the miracles happen. This is the fucking miracle. Yes. Experiencing the thing without having to go somewhere because there's nowhere to go anyway there's nowhere to go anywhere just right here right now what is it that is the juicy gem in the field where no one wants to look yes and how do we lovingly hold space for that gem to be lovingly played with and danced Ah. transmuted into a higher density of light, of consciousness. And you don't even have to do anything. That's what you realize. Like even the thing of looking under the blanket. Eventually you go, there's no blanket. (laughs) What about this anger? What about this thing? What about the boredom? It's an appearance. Ah. 
And then you're just in it. You allow it. And then all of a sudden it just blooms into everything. And you're more rich. You're more... uh. (laughs) To see it as an appearance and to see it not appearing to an identity. Yes. Just as an appearance, as a manifestation of infinite potential without any identity. Yes. There's no little yep. no little atlas experiencing the anger. Yes. But rather just an appearance of infinite potential appearing as anger and then having this level of love and equanimity in the appearance. Mm. And no resistance. Absolute non-resistance. Or fear. You know, fear. I use anger a lot because anger is something that comes up for me. But fear. So many people are experiencing fear. And the fearlessness is exactly what enables us to look at the places that we all struggle with looking at. Yes. Um, Yeah, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. And just to wind that back a little bit. Because as you're on this evolutionary path, evolution of consciousness, call it the pathless path. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) As you're on that and you find yourself going, hey, man, I've got it fucking figured out. I'm a pretty spiritual dude. (laughs) I'm a spiritual cunt, as Frank (laughs) Yang says. (laughs) Yeah. There, the trap is now yes such the a trap. trap of the spiritual path is that all of a sudden you're feeling the things and you're going whoa man whoa i'm spiritual i can't be angry i can't be sad i can't be fucking scared i'm spiritual man i'm way t- Eb, you're way too spiritual to feel that <laughs> that's when you know the ego has stepped back in that's oh, I, I, you know. oh the, I should be much more oneness uh, yeah. here. Wait, wait, man. But then all of a sudden you go, wait. No, that is the thing. Yes, exactly. That's the exact catalyst that is needed right now. It's the exact appearance that is needed right now. That is appearing right now. That's the thing. Yes. Fuck. Yes. Perfect divine appearance for exactly that pathless path to evolution of indescribable perfection. indescribable <laughs> perfection how do we get somebody what is the thing is there a thing like we were talking how do we create an app how do you put dmt into an app Two things I want to say about this. Reality is energy doing work. I had a dream. I had a dream four or five months ago. It was indescribable perfection. There was no ebon. It was complete nothingness. And it was bliss. And it was everything. It It was nothing and it was everything. And I was thinking about it. I've thought about it a handful of times. I've had a handful of absolutely heart exploding dreams. Your dream into into that. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And I thought to myself, oh, if I hadn't been such a heavy meditator on this path, this could have been a terrifying experience. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This could have been a completely terrifying experience. But it was so blissful. There, it was the ocean. It was ocean. It was fucking universal. It was, I, I was everything and nothing. Yes. And it, coming back to Buddha, when I speak, I compromise myself because the words nothingness and everything, how do we, how do we rectify this? How do we, oh, I, yeah. 
There's another dream I want to tell you about. Yes. In this dream, I woke up on this spaceship. And it was, it looked so, like. So far, it doesn't sound like a dream. <laughs> This Wait is. till the end, bro. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're going to realize it's not a dream. I woke up on this spaceship and it looked like the xenomorph from Alien. Organic black skin on everything was the spaceship. And I was with this group of people. And we were all in these... We were all in these xenomorphic space suits. And we had all just woken up and we're sort of wandering around the ship trying to figure out. We know we have a mission and we know we're going somewhere. But we don't know what it is we're doing or where it is we're going. And we're calling in on the on the on the like panel the command center we're calling into hq trying to get the answers and up on the screen is this screen that has us just careening through space so we could see the outside of the ship we're going somewhere no one from hq is responding can't get anything (laughs) not getting any answers right where are we going there was no fear it was just like okay yeah cool like we're figuring this out we're good Seeing space just flying by, stardust is just whipping by. Like if you've ever been in a car at night and it's black in front of you and it's either snowing or misty and you just see the particles just flying through the blackness. That's what it was like. All of a sudden, this voice comes on and it says... There is no mission. There is nowhere to go. You are inside an intergalactic being. And you are a particle of this being. And all of a sudden it like blasted out of the ship. My perception blasted out of the ship. And I just saw us as a particle in this gigantic being's foot going somewhere. And I had the egoic moment of going, oh, man, like there is nothing to do. (laughs) There is nowhere to go. (laughs) But then I just completely surrendered into it. I was like, oh, yeah, that's life. Like we're always searching for the mission. We're searching for the fucking destination. But it's like we're here. Yeah. Already. Yes. Yes. And just like a particle, a cell in your heart or a cell in your brain or a cell in your bones, that cell has no fucking idea where you're going or what you think you're doing. Mm-hmm. All it's doing is being the best heart cell, the best bone cell, the best mm. brain cell it can possibly be. Mm-hmm. The 30 trillion cell and body analogy to the 8 billion person analogy on the planet to the billions of planets in the universe analogy. Yeah. It's like so often, at least for me and my experience, I want to know like, where are we going? What's this about? Those have been big questions for me in my life. (laughs) <laughs> well and they dissolve into the mystery yeah and then all of a sudden it's like oh first of all well one of my great mentors says to me all the time he says Ed, we're on a need to know basis and right now you don't need to know yeah and you know frankly as far as like where we're going or what this is all about it's none of your fucking business because yeah, you're a heart, you're a, a heart cell. cell. Yeah. And a flower does not ask a question about why it, what's it purpose is. It, exactly. The aroma is beautiful. Exactly. So that gets us back to another question. Questions give us more questions. <laughs> so then how do we all tap into our purpose? How do we all tap into our heart cellness? 
What is our divine purpose? And it may look shades. There's shades of it. It may look a little different for everybody. Yeah. What was coming up was abundance. Abundance, prosperity. I love that, dude. Play. How, what was that coming up through? Really the heart. Uh-huh, God, the gut uh-huh. and heart. Just, yeah. Just, and also the feeling of the connectedness that Avalokiteshvara connectedness of the Bodhisattva encompassing all Buddhas. Uh-huh. That that style of just the essence of what it looks like of pure abundance and pure prosperity, pure play in whatever expression it takes on. Right. Yeah. Being of service to the organism. The grand symphony of it all. Yeah. Being of service to it. From a place that's empty of self from a place that's empty of unworthiness or the need for validation. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's, that's the key. And, and the way to, and Eben has been pointing at this several times, but to do the self inquiry, to do the, to do the recognition that, when there is the I, me, or my that seems to arise, to discard it, as Nisargatata Maharaj says, discard it. Discard the like, dislike, indifference. Discard the I, me, my perpetually, neti, neti, not this, not that, over and over and over again until you are just truly empty of self until you are just truly empty of conditioning. Mm. And then the service becomes effortless. Yes. Lao Tzu talked about Wu Wei. This is just an effortless action that's spontaneous and playful and in pure service that's empty of self. Yes. Yes. Out of nothing comes everything. Yeah. So reality is energy doing work. Yeah, and to be really comfortable with being nothing, to be really comfortable with being energy. Energy is. energy is not a thing. It is no thing. This is what's right. This is what's really important. Light electromagnetism is not a thing. This oxygen that is being inhaled, it's no thing. It's not a thing. That's why we habitually overlook it. Mm. Consciousness is not a thing. It's no thing. Awareness is no thing. Mm. The nature of mind is not a thing. It's empty cognizance suffused Mm. with awareness. Mm. There's not a thing when you look. And so when you look, you recognize my nature. You recognize essence. You recognize no thing. And then from there, it's so much easier to empty self, so Mm. much easier to empty conditioning, so much easier to see the arising and passing of a thought or emotion or belief or experience or perception, sensation. This is a whole new level of sovereignty and will and power and choice and oneness and love that emanates into the field in pure service and honor. And to understand that when when you take in this it really does start intellectual in many ways. Right. It starts off intellectual, which is so beautiful because you can use this beautiful intellect to gather concepts, gather ideas. And, you know, the idea of oneness can be understood from an intellectual way with physicalism in the sense of, well, yeah, I guess technically I take these 20,000 inhales a day and it comes from phytoplankton and trees and so there's this indescribable interdependency of oneness that's happening right and so you start intellectually and then over time the mind empties as it becomes more silent and you drop your awareness into your heart and gut and then it's just it becomes visceral oneness moment to moment yes yes and so it's cool like use the intellect to go beyond the intellect. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I had an experience once 
where it was actually when I was still working with Mike and I had no idea what the thing was, but I, I was doing something with another guy who worked there. Like I was bringing him something so that he could complete this thing. And I had such a powerful crystallization of this experience where literally as I was making the handoff of this thing to him, I had this full experience of there was no us and it was the universe coming together to make this thing happen. Perfect. Love it. Just during daytime. Yeah. Yeah, it just was normal. Just, and I was yeah. like, whoa. <laughs> I love this. Like there was no me, there was no him. It was a it was a connection. Of the universe. Particles in the universe yeah. came together to do this thing. Yes. Yes. It's great. Mm. We went to see the Big Lebowski uh this past weekend at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. It was amazing. So fun. I'm watching this movie. It's one. It's probably my favorite movie of all time. And I've always thought it's such a... It's a fairy tale. It's like a... It's, it's mythology. It's got a biblical essence to it. It's spiritual allegory. And it really hit me after watching it this weekend, what it truly was that strikes me about the movie. And it's that you have this character, the dude, who is essentially a nobody because you have no idea where he comes from. You have no real idea of like who he is. You're just dropped in on this character, this nobody who becomes everything to everybody. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, that's it, dude. That's the genius of this film. Yeah. And you see that now after more and more your density of light consciousness increasing, you're able to see at a, at a new depth yeah. That insight. Yeah. Because you watch it five years ago, ten years ago. No. No insight. I'm like, there's something. This movie is so, you know, it's hilarious. It's be- It's a masterpiece of the film. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend and, it. And let's just bring this analogy directly into your life. What are you before your parents are born? Right. Nobody. 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 <laughs> Literally. And then an egg meets a sperm and out of nothing comes everything. Comes everything. Yeah. A single cell, abiogenesis, somehow turns into 10 million fucking species on the planet simultaneously, interdependently playing with themselves, dancing, making a symphony called life. And you are all of it and none of it. And that's the beauty of it. And just yes. the intellectual if it's if it's intellectual play with it intellectually for now yeah and then it becomes more and more experiential and then it becomes realized uh-huh and then it's playing from there yeah there are many paths to the top of the flat mountain yeah the flat mountain i know <laughs> it's so good yeah exactly this this it's a perfect way to summarize the essence of the nature because it has to be simultaneity. It has to be right. it has to be both. So whenever it's paradox. it's paradox. Whenever you see it written as just non duality, it's missing duality. Right. Whenever it's written as just duality, it's missing non duality. When it's written as just individualism, it's missing oneness or non duality. So the equation looks something like the integral of everything 
mm-hmm. the summation of everything. Yes. And so it's flat because there's nothing to do. You're already it. Right. Non-duality. Yeah. And yet there's also the appearance of a dualism where there is some sort of a cloud of separation that people feel like a contracted energy that then apparently goes through a process of seeking and cutting through some sort of clouds mm. that then apparently feels liberated and at one again. Yeah. And so that's this like flat mountain idea or this veilless veil, gateless gate, chainless chains, escapeless escape room. Yeah. Uh, there's so many of these ways yeah. to put it into a simultaneity. Yes. Well, really, you know, I love when I hear you talk about this stuff because my whole system is going through this integration. You too, with this whole episode, it's been so nice. Yeah, dude. Yeah. The biggest issue is that we think it's supposed to feel or look like something else. Yeah. You think, oh, when I'm enlightened, it should feel like... Or it should look like everything is one. But what? That's... You... <laughs> it, it's so weird. It really is weird. Because 10 years ago, there was so much more mind fluctuation. And that's what veiled the uh. oneness. That's what, um, uh-huh. cre- that's what created a seeker. Right, separation right. separation created a seeker and then that contracted energy totally underwent some sort of an apparent apparent process of liberation and and recognizing its boundlessness yeah. its freedom and so that this so, this is the simultaneity whenever you hear a non-dual teacher telling people that come to their meetings that there's nothing to do right. um you just you gotta also yes. you, you recognize both the simultaneity uh-huh. there that's so so crucial. Well, think about it. And this you way. described it as a limbic neuroscientific infrastructure and a prefrontal neuroscientific infrastructure. Yes. And why is there an anapanasati? What do these things truly yield? What fruits do they yield? Where when you used to be reactive and then you went through some sort of an apparent process of creating a gap where you no longer react right away, what did that space actually create? Because is there a difference? There is an apparent difference. Yes. How are you going to describe it? No, no. Uh... It's all, to me, it always comes back to the letting go of the expectation or the perception of it should be something else because this is it, you know? And if you think about it as we were birthed into this dual paradigm, into our individuality, out of the oneness, we are the oneness coming into this individual form in the physical plane. Mm. So we are born with this inherent seeking of how did wait? We were one. Now we're disconnected, but we're not disconnected. Yeah. That's a cool way to put it too. Yep. You are simply the oneness having an experience of itself. Yeah. Perfect. Alan Watts said something. I, this has caught my ear a handful of times lately and I don't think I ever tuned into it, but he talks about how flowers and bees are truly one organism. Yeah. Because the bees carry the pollen from the flowers that they collect nectar out of, spread the pollen and create more flowers and they're interdependent on one another. Yeah. And it's really, truly one organism, the bees and the flowers. We created a separation. Right. Yeah. Just because we look at it and it doesn't look like they're the same organism. We just decided, oh, that's bees and those are flowers and they're different things. 
but they're truly one thing that functions interdependently. And we are truly that with everything. Yes. You know, part of the deal is we think we're not good enough. We're always trapped in we're not good enough or we don't deserve it or we can't possibly be that magnificent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting one. You know? Isn't it? That's an interesting one. I can't possibly be pure potentiality. Yeah. I can't possibly do all that. (laughs) Really? Give it a try. Fuck around, man. See what's up. That's truly the blessing of my life, I would say, is that I was blessed with people around me who always, for better or worse, infused me with the belief that nothing is impossible and the boundlessness of my being. And of course, we come into things, you know. The educational indoctrination system, government, marketing, ads, pharmaceutical companies, all this shit that tells you you need X, Y, and Z to be whole. And so even surely you're like, wait, I I can't be good enough if I don't have the cars and the house and the pills and the girls and the the stuff and the... (laughs) The Gucci belt and the Louis Vuitton. I can't. I'm not good enough. Just letting all of that go. I love that. Again, just going back to before your parents were born and bringing that essence of who you were before your parents were born to now while you're alive. Yeah. And can you be nothing can you be comfortable with being nothing and what does that mean to me that means you are present with everything yes yes because you're you're not locked into some identity ego trip and whole yes yeah whole yeah identity ego trip exactly yeah unwholeness makes identity ego trip Uh uh-huh yes Uh uh-huh so the perception of unwholeness the perception of unwholeness exactly because you're the sun and the sun cannot go out and look for more light to be added to it. Mm. This, the cup, when the cup is full, it cannot receive more water into it. Just ha- your cup is always full uh-huh. and coming from wholeness is coming from sourcefulness is coming from being okay with being nothing and everything. Yes. And just pop, just try just like, Pop the dream for a moment. Uh-huh. Just like be okay with the dream just <laughs> disappearing. What is the dream? Life. Whatever it is. Just like we dream at night. Yeah. We dream at night. We simulate out this like beautiful complex reality that that has uh, an apparent um, observer uh, that um, it does not. Uh, it's, it seems like there is some sort of differentiation between the observer and other observers or the trees or the cars or the roads. And the goes, there, there's apparently the experience of some sort of senses, but you know you just simulated a dream. And so how are there actually senses? And, and, and then at, after a period of uh, exploration of some sort, you wake up. And then you wonder, did that happen? So there's just a oneness that's a no no thingness undergoing an exploration. And so you just create an analogy to the universe, to life. And, Uh. And there is a very deep recursion where the the procedure calls on itself and it makes so much sense where life, the procedure of the dream calls on itself at night for eight hours. And it's not always dream. Sometimes it's deep sleep. Sometimes it's dream. And it's 
this is the indescribable perfection. This is pure potentiality. This is nothing being everything. And it's heartwarming to deplete yourself of identity and ego and selfishness and conditioning and all these patterns of behavior that create suffering and malevolence and it's incredible to shift towards abundance and prosperity and well-being and oneness and unity and harmony and sourcefulness in the field because we have our children and we have also this incredible so it's the simultaneity where yes this is indescribable perfection now right now right here as it is and yet also there's this yeah we have some kids and we have an apparent future and it's cool to also undergo said inward turn of what is it that destroys more of the separation and what is it that increases the unity and uh. it, yeah so it's already 100 percent always whole and yet it's simultaneously dissolving more and more of the dreamed illusory separation love that dude dude just such a good back and forth yeah so good yeah really fun so really good. fun um the last thing I want to say is as there are many paths to the mountain As my mentor also said, you don't walk up the mountain, you float. <laughs> <laughs> because as you let go of things, you become lighter. Perfect. And that's the process of enlightenment. Perfect. Enlightenment is not about what we gain. It's about what we let go of. Coming back to your analogy of He said so many good things, but, you know, you are that black hole of awareness at the center of your being and just letting go of all that stuff that's floating around because you can do that. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Do you think one last question I would have for you? Do you feel like because I have I know I have a tendency to believe that. progression or evolution is interdependent on or a effect of how much struggle or hardship or difficulty one walks through or transcends. Mm. Yes. Do you think that's inherent in the process of conscious evolution or growth or spontaneous I love that. Enlightenment. There's so much simultaneity again. Oh yeah. Because the oh, yeah. shadow does very clearly birth fire. Right. And then there's also the apparent no shadow somehow right. birthing right fire right and whenever i um whenever evolution comes up there's this that's just the story it's true that it's also just the story it's infinity appearing like something that we call evolution right right and and we cool like we give that a thumbs up and yet also you know you're sitting here promulgating the story of of it's just infinity appearing as evolution. And then when some sort of malevolence pathology develops within the body and you go into the Western hospital system to get healed, all of a sudden you have this fear instinct that kicks up. Am I going to die? Am I going to die? And then there's this, Oh my gosh, thank you. Western medicine. Thank you so much for saving me because you knew about the form and you knew about pathology and you knew about how to take it away and so that's also a process of the appearance of evolution learning about 
itself through the analysis of form to be able to again just merge together the the very non-dual it's just an appearance with the simultaneity of yeah there's something that we call form and when we get really good at it we can do cool things yeah. like we just described yeah i like that yeah i have a i have a um one of the core things that we mentioned throughout was the analogy of like a black hole with all of its stars and planets around it that you can visualize as your name. Mm -hmm. Like you have these four characters, E, B, E, N, and they're just symbols that we strung together to identify a piece of life. Mm -hmm. And your whole game of reality is basically tied to that first star system, you could yeah. say, near the black hole. The whole game is pretty much tied to that. Um, so if you can make some sort of like loosening malleability with that first one of your I, me, my, which is like this first link from the black hole, um, everything else after that with its likes, dislikes, and differences, preferences, family, friends, career, all that stuff, more easily also dissolves. So... So just imagine and visualize yourself as a galaxy and um, just use Love your that. eye. Like, look at your fucking eye. Your yeah. eye is the galaxy. You have right. a black hole called a pupil right there. Yeah. And you have an iris around it that is like the stars and the planets. And if you can just look at someone else's black hole, you recognize that it's that same black holeness. Huh. And then the iris is this unique differentiatedness of the costume of the appearance and yeah in the ultimate analysis you will always see a simultaneity you will always see a oneness and you'll always see a differentiation in the density of love light consciousness yes. simultaneously yeah which is why you have someone like Eben that's just like just chill in and then you have someone else that's like <sighs> And so that's your differentiation, uh -huh. but it's also oneness. So it's awesome, bro. Seriously. Awesome. Yeah. So, so fun. So good. I'm glad we got this in before you roll. Yeah. And we'll have a round three at some point. Oh, definitely. Potentially like two of these a year or something. I'd love that. Yep. And just do a little, um, it'll be so interesting to see what is that's like round three. What will that be? Where will we be? We'll do the side the wordless words. Wordless, <laughs> wordless word podcast. <laughs> we all right. We'll just beautiful. be transmitting fucking frequencies. Yeah, that'll be hilarious. Oh gosh, awesome, dude. So good. Thank so you. good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Infinite love for you, fam. Thank you. Thank you. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what resonated, what were some key insights for you. Also, like the video. Helps out that algorithm. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Also, share the video with other people that you feel like this would positively influence. Create those butterfly effects. Check out all of the links in the bio below. We have Eben's YouTube page where he's posting his ebb and flow podcast. He's got a lot of great content on there that further unpacks what he was sharing. So go and subscribe to his channel, check out some of his content. Also it's on iTunes. That link is below his Instagram. His Twitter is down there. His recent book that he authored with Augustus, a life worth dying for is also in the bio below. You can check that out. And also his Patreon is down there because Eben is independent and so support him it's just some simple tiers you know just click on the low tier the mid, mid tier just click on one of those and support it's really important that we keep if you have the ability independent artists creating content and that is all infinite love as always da, da, da. Da, da. Love you guys. Peace.